But I remember I started interacting with different energies. As you still are part of the food chain. <laughs> so if you know that you live in a place where there are animals that can eat you, it kind of changes your mindset a little bit. Have you encountered other people with those goblins? Have you ever seen the goblins? All of the stage of the progression where I'm at in this experience and what I'm able to, how the beauty that I see this this universe unfolding before in every moment. For me, it's unbelievable. I agree. I've always thought there's, I'm living life, but also life is living me. All right, everybody. Today we have Frankie Finn on the show. Frankie yes. is a thought leader. He is an expert in the world of digital marketing. And now get this, the shamanic, psychedelic mindset behind what's going on in the digital world, the propaganda factories, how they're working. Now, this guy has been in my life for about the last 15 years. He has taught me as much, if not more, than some of the core top people in my life. It's an honor to have him on the show. Frankie Finn, welcome to the Blue Morpho Podcast. Dude, that's a hell of an intro. Appreciate that. I, I feel like the feeling is mutual. If I list the pe people who've taught me more than anything, like Hamilton South is, is, if not number one on that list, very, very high on that list. Oh, well, Frankie, you know, I appreciate that as well. One of the core things I think that we both realized in this life uh, as we got to know each other is the importance of mentors. And it's a real pleasure to have kind of that co-mentor role with some people. Doesn't always happen, but when it does and there's synergy, that's, uh, you know, always a beautiful thing. So just wanted to send my gratitude and thanks to you for being in that co-mentor role with me over the years. Yeah, or likewise, it's been uh, it's been a wild journey getting to know you. I'll, I, there's definitely like a pre Hamilton life and a post Hamilton life, and those look very, very, very different. A lot of, a lot of different colors and flavors to that. All right. Well, as as we're going to get into this, I want to ask that: What is the give? Just walk me through the pre Hamilton life, and then how you actually came about finding me, and then some of the post Hamilton life. Just take us through that that trajectory quickly just to kind of get to know you a little bit. Yeah, I mean, obviously, you know the story well, because you were on the other end of uh, the receiving it. But it, it's probably it's one of those stories that if it hadn't happened to me, it's almost so crazy that I wouldn't have believed it. I mean, I it was, I want to say 2007, the economy was just like going in the tanks. And I was kind of forced into something I'd always wanted to do, but like in my own way resisted, like going into business for myself, working online, that kind of thing. And I was just, I remember being like riddled with anxiety and worry about the future. And I had all this money stress and I was, you know, daily, like sometimes when I would actually try and envision a better future, it would like actually induce panic attacks inside me, just the act of trying to focus my mind. And it was it, this whole, while well, this whole thing was going on, I magically heard about this substance called ayahuasca and, and it became like an obsession for me when I first heard about it. Um, Googling it every day. And it was a really interesting experience for me because both my parents were alcoholics and my dad was like a really hardcore drug addict. So like just in my eyes, all drugs were bad and we would just avoid those. And here I am going, you know, this crazy psychedelic sounds a little bit different than everything else. And so as you know, which I don't recommend for anybody listening to this, but I was dumb enough to try it on my own. I did it six times over two years. And it was really the third experience that like kind of started the journey towards Hamilton Souther. Uh, the first time I took it was just like a small amount. Nothing really happened. The second time got a little bigger. But the third time I remember it, I had read all these stories, a lot of them actually secondhand experiences of you. I just didn't know it at the time. But I listened to people have these crazy life altering healing stories and cancer cured and blindness had their vision restored and just all these kind of things. And here I was like taking this ayahuasca and I was, I was tripping my face off, but it wasn't like very mystical or profound. Like it was colorful and mind altering, but I wasn't like, you know, like, Oh my God, I feel healed by the, the cosmos or anything. And I remember right as that happened, um, I, I said to myself in my own mind, I said like, where's my mystical heal healing experience. And my right arm went up and it like, 
the best I could describe it is it physically took over my body and then my arm lunged down and grabbed this Kleenex box off the ground. And it was such a strange experience because it was so robotic that I used my other hand to push that away. And I was like, okay, whatever that was, like, <laughs> no moss. No, let's not do that again. And of course, two minutes later, I asked the same question. Where's my healing experience? Arm goes up, lunges down, grabs this Kleenex box. So it happened about five times. And um, what ended the Kleenex box said on, the, on it, it said, of the words, dreams and inspirations. And it had like a university fractal galaxy kind of thing. And as I, I was looking at it, like the words started to float out of the Kleenex box and kind of landed at me. And I, I kind of embodied their meaning. Like I became like very inspired in that moment. And it was, it was just a little insignificant thing at that exact moment, but there's a little blue butterfly in the top left of this Kleenex box. And so this, what was really interesting about it is, is the next day I started seeing blue butterfly synchronicities like 15, 20 times a day. And also I started seeing like numbers that were like, I would, I can remember like I turn on the hockey game and it would be, the score would be one to one in the first period with 11, 11 to go. So it would just be one, 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 one. And that happened like six, seven times where the exact moment I turned it on was all ones and you know, clocks would be like that. And I remember like some of them were just really out there. Like I can remember asking my girlfriend Trish at the time, hey, can you grab a vegetable tray? We're at the grocery store. We took it home and the tray was a blue butterfly and like in each wing, they got like cucumbers and tomatoes or somebody said, oh, you should, if you're getting into psychedelics, you should listen to this Terrence McKenna guy. I wasn't really that interested in listening to him, but all right. Begrudgingly, I, I searched for a video. He's giving a lecture wearing a blue butterfly t-shirt and it just like, it followed me everywhere. The most interesting one for me was like closest to what, post Hamilton life looked like because in the, I was, uh, I was playing in this video game called the legend of Zelda skyward sword. And in the game, uh, there's these meadows with blue butterflies floating in a circle. And I just kept thinking, here we go with more blue butterflies, this unanswered question of what does this all even mean? And in the game, the, the video game character gets knocked out. The princess goes missing and you wake up and in the game, there's a spirit right over your head. And it says, like, I can't explain, but you need to go with me. And you follow this spirit. And then I, I ended up in this temple and it taught me this, like, healing song in the game. And, you, and then it said, go play it where the blue butterflies gather. And what would happen is either it would heal your character, like the game would restore your health and vitality and all that. Or it would give you some old wisdom that, like, would enable you to get further into the journey than you could without it. Or they would be gateway points where you would leave your physical body, go collect items and things that you could then use in the real world. And that's the closest thing that happened to me because I remember the sixth time I took it on my own, which again, I don't recommend without somebody like you who's a professional, but um, I had a vision of a giant blue butterfly made of millions of tiny blue butterflies. And I remember when I started sobering up after two years of seeing this 20 times a day for two years, I, I just decided to Google blue butterfly ayahuasca. Like that was the only thing my nerd brain could figure out. And there, of course, is Hamilton South or Blue Morpho Retreat. So I took it as a sign like I was to come and visit you. And about like, I don't know, a couple weeks later, I was going through a crisis of like, I wanted to, to use my marketing skills to sell something meaningful. And I remember reaching out to you and just saying like, I have some ideas for you. I'd love to come down. And, and I, I don't even remember how the whole thing went but I just remembered nobody told me but you had actually had a ceremony and said we're working on this music stuff spirits bring me a marketing person and so there was this kind of like showing up at the time you know uh like very Harry Potter like when you need the room the room shows up kind of thing and post Hamilton life has been a very different story full of you know spirits and a lot more uh mystical kind of experiences and wild out there journeys and less linear life but I'm happy to say on the business front the, the the reasons i came to you were like that whole anxiety i think you fixed that thing in about 40 minutes from the time i met you and i've never had it since but it was you know well that's amazing uh what i think is also incredible about your story is that you started going into your own world of business and really kind of taking your own strides for your own life you know and you started carving your own path at the same time that you started using these plant medicines as a way to be able to support and help that journey. Take us from that point where you were, you know, going 2007 and deciding that you're going to go out into business on your own and take us a little bit on that journey from uh, getting started to what it was like to learn, et cetera, and then where you are now. Yeah, I think there's, there's some of us that just like weren't meant to be 
working for somebody else. Like, and I don't even mean that like in the sense of uh, more than anything, just like that, like we can't, I can't show up on time. I can't not find better ways. I can't, can't punch a clock. Like I'm just not built for that. So I'd always kind of fantasized about that life, but been like my internal fears and beliefs, all that kind of just held me back for a, a really long time. And then around 2007, and uh, I was kind of like just forcefully put into the fire in the sense that uh, the uh, the economy was basically in the shits at that time. Like it was a major recession in my local area, which was Windsor, Ontario, Canada, which is where I was born, is a lot like Detroit, Michigan, very dependent on Ford, General Motors, Chrysler. And those companies were announcing like massive layoffs. So Windsor was extra hard hit by that. They were laying off like 25% of the city sometimes in a day. They'd say like, all right, 40,000 of you guys are out of work kind of thing. And so it was, it was this, like, I couldn't fall back on a job. I actually remember going to a job fair and the only thing there was uh, like commission only jobs where you have to like hunt for your lunch. Like if you want to sell insurance, you can do that. But like, I, I realized that like, there was no more plan B. So it kind of forced me into that. And it was the first two years in particular, were probably the, the hardest two years of my life. And, and, certainly in a professional sense, because it was like, you don't know what you don't know. I just remember actually, I had a friend who called me up one day and he said, I wrote a real estate course and we're going to sell it on the internet. And I remember I said, we? He's like, no, dude, you're going to sell your own real estate course. And uh, and then I thought about it for a day after he hung up and I was like, well, what else do you have? What else are you going to do? And I, I didn't have a better idea to go with at the time. And it ended up teaching me like, because you know, I had these visions in my head that like, you know, this field of dreams is like, if you build it, you will come. Like if I just put a course on the internet, people would magically show up and buy it. And I didn't have to say anything. They would already know what it is. And I realized that when I got into that journey, how little I actually knew. And I had to figure out how to bring people to a website, what to say, what was meaningful to them, what was different in the marketplace, how to study people. And since then, you know, the the merging of those two things has really deepened my understanding of like how humans really think and how humans really make decisions, including myself. Like, you know, it's not limited to like, it's, you know, it's a study of ourselves at the same time, but it's been a wild, fascinating thing. It's like, um, I went in there just thinking like, you know, I just want to sell this course on the internet so I could live anywhere. And since then it's been a, what's been interesting is, is, you know, we've probably lived in like 30 different countries, Ilka and I, um, you know, we're pretty location independent. I can do kind of whatever I want, whenever I want. I'm not saying I have it all figured out, but I think we have a pretty cool life relative to, uh, you know, where most people are at in this journey. Oh, there's no doubt about that. I mean, I remember when you were first telling me about SEO and what you were trying to do with that and how much you really didn't like that really. Like, you were just <laughs> like there's some core inner wounds associated with having yeah. to deal with all of that. And then where you're now, how would you describe uh, where you are now with business? What are you doing? What's the name of your business? Uh, just talk us through that. Um, yeah, well, first let me address those inner wounds because anybody who's just like experienced one time a website tell you your password is not complicated enough and it needs like the Batman symbol and an upside down Q and 20 extra characters. And then when you try and log in, it can't remember it because it was never complicated in the first place just imagine doing that a thousand times a day for seven straight years that's that's seo in a nutshell um so yeah so you know a lot of it i'd say the 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 probably the one of the most meaningful things is you know one of the things i i was looking for from you but i didn't consciously know that i was looking for is is to identify what's actually purposeful and I realized the, the, you know, one of the most important things in, in having like a purposeful life or business or contribution in that sense is actually who you work with. And it, it, it took me a long time to realize the people I enjoyed most were other people like me who worked on their laptop and could be independent. And they, when you say the word crypto, they know what that is and they don't look at you all cross-eyed and, and, you know, there, there's all kinds of keywords and buzzwords. So the first part of it that, that's really been a difference maker for me now is like when I actually do business now, it's way more fun than it's ever been. Like I, it's, you know, I'm not saying there aren't challenging moments. There certainly are, but um, I have a couple of businesses right now. So we run different marketing campaigns uh, for lawyers. I don't really have a name for that business. It just gets billed as like, I don't know, Frankie Finn consulting, whatever, if you want to call it that. Um, I I also coach and mentor other agency owners and we're just get, getting started in a third business where we're doing wholesaling real estate, which is very much in the infancy stages, but 
I'm super stoked about where that's going to go direction wise. And as you know, you know, Big Daddy over here wrote a book on it as well. Um, it's kind of a cool thing to say. I literally wrote the book on it, but I had no idea when I was doing a, all this stuff, you know, 15 years ago, just trying to figure out how to get people to my own website and sell my own stuff that I would be paving a path for thousands of people behind me that were trying to do a similar kind of journey. And, you know, one of the things that information is now abundant online, but there's also like a lot of shitty information for lack of a better way of saying it. And it's a lot of stuff that like to me is, is actually counterproductive and makes people work harder and makes people build businesses that they hate. And having done that, you know, it's easier to guide people out of those things into more purposeful things that are simpler, but more profound. You know, I, I like to say small, but meaningful differences in people's lives. And when you do that, um, I don't know, the game's just more fun because you're working like most of my day is spent working with people I like doing stuff I like doing the, the kind of stuff I like. I have a team that supports me, all the stuff I don't like doing for the most part. Somebody else is responsible. I've realized over the years that the things I hate doing, other people love doing. So like, why hang on to the work? that I hate when somebody else is like chomping at the bit to want to do the things that cause me misery and grief. And so I wouldn't say I've got it all figured out by any stretch of the imagination, but more than anything, it's just a lot more purposeful. It's a lot more fun. And of course, you know, like when you're, when you're doing purposeful work and it's fun, like it's very easy to make it profitable because, you know, you, you don't have all this resistance to what you're doing in the day to day. One of the things you've expanded into in the last years is coaching and really being a mentor there for other people, like you said, paving the way for thousands of people. Talk us about coaching and walk us through what it's like to uh, be a coach. What do you like about it? Um, you know, how do you mentor other people and and how do you really help them get the most out of what they're trying to do? Yeah, it's it's really interesting because I've had people come to me and say, like, you know, I want to be a life coach or whatever. And how do I, you know, get started with that process? And for me, like, I wish I could tell you, I had some like bolt of lightning, like I want to be a coach. I actually um, had just figured out like webinars on, online, like we were selling a massive amount of stuff through webinars. And I had a lot of friends who were trying to sell similar things to me that kept asking me to, you know, can you help me build a webinar like this thing? And, and I decided that one day I would put on an event and I would invite some of my friends who were like in similar situations who I knew would benefit from it. And uh, it just worked out that a lot of them, like I would say like 60, 70% of them were other marketing agency owners. I didn't plan it that way. I didn't uh, say one day I want to coach these people. And what ended up happening is, is after a, a day we were finished with the webinar and it was a three day event and it just turned into like Q and A about how do you deal with this when a client says this, what do you do about that? billing and blah 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 and and not just me but the the like the people in the room were giving answers to each other like somebody had solutions and i had a few people that left that event and like two three days later made like a massive change there was one guy who was like for example he was selling 500 dollars a month local seo he messaged me i don't know like a couple weeks later to say like i landed two ten thousand dollar per month contracts with these big corporations and their two-year contracts so now I have like a guaranteed 400,000 coming for the next two years coming from somebody who was struggling to get like these low value things. And I was just so blown away by it. And it was so much fun that I thought maybe I should do more of this. And it wasn't like I intentionally woke up. So I think part of it is, is finding people that are like you, that are you kind of like five years ago. Cause I, I never like planned to make that kind of impact on those people or even work with those people. And if anything, I was just trying to sell an event to my webinar thing. But, you know, seeing how how much it actually changed lives and how much people got out of it. And I realized after I went through it, like they were very similar to me. They were on the same journey, but they were just a couple of years behind on that same kind of thing. And there were more similarities than differences. And so I think if somebody wants to actually be like a useful coach where the people are easy to help and, and you also have a great deal of empathy for people who are on the same journey as you, but just like years behind and, and I don't think you need to be all things to all people, like if, if you're looking at that, because, um, you know, there's other areas where I have mentors, where I'm behind people in life. It's it's usually like one of four areas. You're either going to help people with some form of relationship, some form of finance, uh, some form of health or some form of like spirituality. And I would just look at like the things that are naturally interesting to you. And if you're doing that, uh, what you'll find is they're easy to talk about. Like I, I create a lot of content in that, in this thing. And a lot of people have asked me before, like, how do you put up so much stuff? And the tr 
truth is I can't shut up about it, right? Because it's 15 years of my life. Like I need I need some way to release it and to vent it and to talk about it to somebody who will find it interesting. And I think those are the things that you'll naturally be good at coaching, where if you could just, somebody could wake you up at three in the morning and you could still be helpful to somebody five years before you, you'll you'll just be a naturally good coach at it. And we, we like to think almost always because they're, um, entrepreneurship and like people like us, we're always forward facing. So you never really feel adequate to where you're going. So you forget that there's like a thousand people behind you that wish they could be where you're at today. And almost always in different areas of your life, like those are the easiest and best people to coach, especially if it's around a topic that you just like talking about anyway, and can be useful to people. And, and, and really so much of it to me is giving them new perspective, but that's how I would look at it. It's like, I didn't wake up and say, I want to be a coach, but it certainly turned into that. Tell me about like, you know, two or three tips that you would give anybody that kind of come out of your coaching, you know, program and stuff like that, that, that really exemplifies the kind of teachings that you have and the kind of wisdom that you share with people. Like, what have you found to be really pithy, like really on point that's important, you know, in the last days? Well, a lot of the, my folks are selling like, uh, um, intangible things like marketing services. And there's a lot of things that that have more similarities than that. Like a lot of the stuff I actually learned working with lawyers because it's a very intangible service. When you sign up for a legal thing, you don't really know what the process entails. You don't really know what the outcome is supposed to look like. You have an idea in your mind. Uh, people who sell investments or all those, there's, there's tons of like high ticket services, consulting, coaching things that all fit under that umbrella where they're intangible. And I think one of the biggest things people miss is so much of the struggle I see with people is they don't know how to paint a clear picture of the expectation of what is to come in the future. And I had a lawyer explain it to me really, really simply. He said, if I tell a client, I think we're going to get you $15,000 and I get him $10,000, he thinks I'm the worst lawyer who ever existed. He says, if I tell him, I think we're going to get 10,000 and we get 15 and we get five extra, he thinks I'm the greatest lawyer ever. And so much of that is not whether you get people 10,000 or 50. I see this over and over as people enter into these relationships for an intangible thing. And they think they're on the same page about what it is they're trying to create. And they're usually not. And so I've learned like one of the simplest things you can do is just carve out expectations of clearly spell out what is a clear result that we're after. Clearly spell out how long you think it's going to take. Clearly spell out how much you think it's going to cost. And clearly spell out how much you think you're going to have to talk or communicate with each other to achieve that. And if you just do that, what I found is, is oftentimes, even if you're not like the, I get the, the, like, you know, using the lawyer example, even if you're not the guy who gets the biggest settlements, you'll have the happiest people because you'll remove so much of the anxiety. And to give an example of this, this is like a true story, by the way, my next door neighbor in Mexico here, I live in like a kind of affluent, mostly retired Americans mix of like uh doctory kind of Mexican types as well. And uh, he got his house built. And I said, like, how was that experience? And he said, it was the worst effing experience in my life. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, I sent my life savings to Mexico for a second home. And then nobody messaged me back. And I didn't hear anything for like six months. After six months, I got a form in the mail that was in Spanish and I couldn't understand it. And I didn't know what they were trying to tell me. And I said, what happened? And he said, after a year, I drove here and the house was perfect and there was nothing wrong with it. It was on budget and everything was on point, but that process created a year's worth of anxiety because yeah. they weren't on the same page about the things I just described. And if they had just done the opposite and taken a proactive approach and said, Hey, you know, I know it doesn't look like much, but here's a little video. This is your piece of land. You own it. Hey, here's a little video. We're putting up a foundation and obviously I don't build houses. So I'm just kind of like BSing a little bit, but um, hey, here's like, we just put up the walls today. Hey, we're putting in the electrical. Hey, uh, Tony over here noticed a problem over there. So we kind of have to backtrack a day or whatever. But if they gave you updates and let you know and communicated what to uh, to expect in that process, you would actually accept a lesser house and feel happier about the experience. And I see this all the time where people just aren't on the same page about expectations. And so I think before like people enter into these intangible things, getting on the same page about those things, will make life so much easier and you'll have much happier relationships. And it's universally true, almost in any business. The only time I would say 
it's it's maybe not as applicable if you're selling like little plastic trinkets and they get there in a day you could probably get away without expectations but even then it would still make your business life easier and i see this done over and over where people just aren't on the same page about what what they're actually entering into and i'm not really talking about contracts either because a lot of times people think i'll pin people down in legal so that they can't you know say we didn't say that earlier but i'm talking about like just having a clear picture of okay, we're going to build your house and it's going to take us a year and it's going to cost this much money. And we're going to give you a once a month update of where the process is at. You know, Rodrigo over here is going to call your, your number that you've given us and just give you an update where we're at. Like so much of that takes the anxiety out of it. And I think people will have just better business relationships so they just follow that one thing. Cause I think it's like such an underrated part of doing business. I mean, how many times have we bought something and it like, you know, there was no house we got ripped off right so like there there's a lot of reasons people a lot of baggage people bring to those relationships and when you can bring trust and a clear picture of the future what you'll find is like people are just cooler and easier to deal with i think managing expectations is an unbelievably important thing right yeah. like one of the things i've learned over the years is that we just don't see things eye to eye like no one does things the same way Right. So I've, I've given people tasks to do thinking that they would understand a core logic that sat underneath the task and why. And it just doosh, gone. Right. Like it's not even part of it at all. And so I think managing expectations is unbelievably important. That's sort of like a really like a key idea that I think we can all uh you know, use not just in our business life, but also in every single aspect of our life. Like where do our expectations meet the experience and how can the experience ultimately be better than our expectations? Because I think if our expectations are not being constantly met, we're going to always be in like some kind of state of anxiety or frustration with it. It's going to build up some kind of negativity, you know, mm -hmm. on that notion of expectations, I got to talk about this with you. You know, I didn't have an expectation when I came into the earth about, you know, life and what it would all be like and like the current state of global affairs and what was going on with the homo sapiens sapiens species. I was kind of like perplexed in my, you know, teenage years and trying to figure it out, ultimately studied them and whatever. So I wanted to uh, just discuss a little bit with you about kind of where you're at on what you think is going on in the world, uh, kind of where are we at as a as a collective um, yeah, just if you can start to unpack that, what are some thoughts you have on, on all I that? I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, as somebody who just had three kids in the last four years, I have a, I have more, like, I'd say 60% of the time I'm in the medicina, thanks to you. And I'm, I'm flowing and life is good. And 20% of the time I'm just angry at the stupidity of the world. Like, like our species is just crazy about one of the things is, is that you've taught me as, as you release so much of these things that are like kind of put into us that like, I don't know, you, you kind of realize how everybody else around you is fucking crazy all the time. <laughs> like it's just a byproduct of it is as, as you find sanity, you realize how little of it actually exists in our world. And then I'd say probably 20% of the time I'm, anxious about this whole you know ai dystopian super state that it seems like we're headed towards i don't know that's just the honest truth about it I mean, we've talked about this ai you know thing i mean i'm into it right everyone knows i'm a technologist and a futurist on top of the sacred plants and anyone knows if you've drunk enough ayahuasca that ayahuasca is a technology right or at least it, it awakens within us technology it might just be a pure sense of intelligence but oh it, it ultimately goes into technology and I know you've interacted with technology for the last 15 years and you kind of have this like unique perspective on, like, as you call it, AI super state. So well, where does that all fit in with like social media? How does all of this work? What is propaganda for you? And uh, what is mass sort of like, what are mass media channels? What's going on? Well, I mean, I, I see a massive amount of propaganda in the world and the difference between like what I consider to be like real, honest marketing and propaganda is the intention like propaganda is to me when you're trying to deceive somebody and get them to do something that is is really only to your benefit and marketing is is where you're actually trying to understand them and meet them where they're at to get them to do something that they're trying to do anyway and trying to get them to like actually help them on the journey even though like sometimes you you, you get pretty out there on the on the, the tactics and the strategies um how do I see the whole social media world? 
I mean, I don't know. I mean, it's it's crazy to think like, you know, I just see it with my kids. They're they're bombarded with messages on TV. They drive down the street. There's billboards. There's 87 social platforms. And like, you know, understanding that all of that is run by artificial intelligence and algorithms that are collecting data for people like you and me that want to run marketing campaigns so that we can turn around and go show my ads to all the people who buy celery juice because I got a celery juice machine that I want to sell, right? <laughs> You know, obviously I want to show it to the people who are going to buy it. And, and, but the flip side of that is, is also, if you, if you know how to use it, it can be like a crazy lucrative tool for business, especially understanding how it all weaves together. Like I I've been pioneering something in kind of my own life that I call omnipresence. And the idea is it's very simple, which is um, the more places people see, the more they believe you. And I've talked about this with you privately, but I've realized that, the people you don't want to have relationships with in life, for the most part, only have one way to reach you, usually an email or maybe a text message or something like that, or an inbox of some social platform. And they usually just like blast you some kind of like buy my shit kind of message. And then the people that you actually develop real relationships with, and I'm not even talking about just like in-person relationships, because sometimes we have these purely digital relationships with influencers and content producers that we look up to almost always you follow them in five, six, seven, eight places. And so if you understand that people you have real relationships with um, are almost always across platforms. So, I mean, I don't necessarily know what like social media is going to become, but like for me to use it, I see it as like when you're distributing a message, the more you can hit people from different angles and different platforms, the faster you can build relationships at scale using like things like video where people get to know you. Like I have people reach out to me every day, say like, I feel like I know you. I feel like I've, I've watched a hundred hours of your stuff, but on my side of it, they just showed up in my inbox two minutes ago. And I've, I've literally never heard of this person until two minutes ago. And so when you understand that you can build relationships at scale and find your people through the system without actually having to, you know, do a lot of old school shaking hands with people and doing things like that, where you can use one to many tools where you can like digitally clone yourself and do that kind of um, ad nauseum. Where is it going? I have no idea, but I don't think it's like benevolent intentions, but I think we can use it in business to, to, to influence a lot of people for better and to, you know, <laughs> sell our stuff for lack of a better term. So one of the things I've been recently playing with is an understanding that AI in terms of machine learning and mathematics is literally algorithms. It's just math code. So it yeah. doesn't have skin in the game. It doesn't have a moralistic perspective, good or bad. It doesn't have a negative perspective, good or bad. And what it's using is attention. And so if attention is something that you're wanting from somebody else, because you're an educator or you're a coach or you're a mentor and you have a message and you want to share that message with the world and you want the right audience to be able to find you and hear that message, resonate with that message and actually get something very positive from it. These tools can actually be used for that. And that was like a yeah. light bulb moment for me because before that I was like, look, I just want to be in the jungle. I just want to be with my plants. Right. And then I was looking at the world and thinking like, first of all, there's a lot else going on in the world that where people are using all these things, like you said, doing it on your own and, you know, hit or miss and every, you know dangers and stuff out there about this and no way to disseminate really important information and get it out there to the people, you know, and then I started to see these tools as actually being the tools that made it possible, you know, and then as increased popularity around certain search terms or certain topics ultimately starts to catch fire with the population, it gives you an opportunity then to provide positive information, positive influence, real support and help that can actually, uh, you know, help further an earth first, people first, really positive, uh, you know, outcome. And yeah. I think part of the things that, that you do when you're mentoring and you're coaching, part of the things that you're doing when you're in the spiritual paths, trying to awaken people and support and help them is give them the tools that they need to be able to do better in their lives. And I have to say, growing up, I mean, I got education, but I wasn't given life tools where do you feel like through the first, you know, 20, 30 years of your life, the adult population had given us a bunch yeah. of life tools? <laughs> yeah. No, no, no we just, no. You just get dropped in the fire or the frying pan and realize your feet are smoking. Some, some cheap beer and, uh, and, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and a, a, 
a big industrialized society. You know, so I, I think that's when all of a sudden it flipped for me because before that I wasn't, I mean, I, I'd heard the negatives, whatever, and I didn't really like the idea of, you know, just what seemed to be like a lot of banal content or just kind of purposeless content going through, like, look at me, look at me, look at me going through these platforms. And, yeah. you know, we were trying to get past the me and that fixation, right? That's where all the problems were for everybody. So it seemed like kind of counterproductive, but all of a sudden it was really more about like, hey, we're trying to share this message. We're trying to get what we do out there. You're trying to help the next 1000 people that are five years behind where you are. You're trying yeah. to get people who are running agencies, they're running businesses, they're young entrepreneurs, they're founders, they're CEOs. You're trying to reach them and give them tools and capacities so that they can further their work and, and actually accelerate their development, right? Like something that took you five years, you can impart on them wisdom that takes them now a few days. Yeah. And that acceleration and growth is like really paying it forward and creating exponential, uh, you know, positive in this world, really. And I, I never saw that before. And, you know, with what we're doing with the Blue Morpha Academy and wanting to share really educational content and get a standardization out there around sacred plants and these other kinds of, you know, kind of expanded states of consciousness experiences, I kind of finally came to realize social media was the tool that we needed to use. And it's a popularity contest. So, you know, take it for what, what, what you will. But in that popularity contest, if people are searching the keywords that you're actually putting content out about, they will find you. And I remember growing up, it was unbelievably hard even to find a phone number I needed. You had to go out and get the white pages or the yellow pages and actually flip through it and look through it. And so this is now grab an electronic device, go into a search engine, put in some, you know, a little bit of code, put in a search word, and they can actually find Frankie Finn and they can relate. And like you said, there's hundreds of hours of your content out there now that people can come and actually start to consume for free. And that wasn't available when I was a kid. And I think that's actually the real positive of this. And I also yeah, remember like, you know, we started with, with online courses back in the mid 2000s. It was unbelievably hard to create them. It was unbelievably expensive to create them. We had to actually code some of ours ourselves. And that yeah, now is SaaS simple. software. Yeah. Right. Like, no, it's so simple. And so I think that that's actually like the brilliance of this. If we can, as a community, get behind the idea of using this for good, using this for positivity, making really consumable, exciting content that's positive, right, for people, not just brain numbing, you know, watch my dance video again, but actually yeah. something that's educational. Um, you can impart a tremendous amount of wisdom through these tools in a very short time and actually help people in a, in a really incredible way. Now, that yeah. being said, I, I'm surprised you've, you've become a, you know, for me, I'm surprised that you've become in your own sense of coach and educator, right? I know you tra you taught me over the years and stuff like that, but I didn't know you were going to ultimately do that for people. So uh, along those lines, what do you kind of see as, you know, your life purpose and, you know, the sort of your destiny? Yeah, like, like go into, go into life purpose for me. Well, you know, it's funny because I remember actually I was doing a, a legal speech and it was it was pretty nerve wracking for me. I had an audience of, I don't know, 500 to 1000 lawyers or so. And they're all like, you know, relatively prominent, like state leaders and market leaders, not like the small ones, the 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 big shots, if you will. And I remember the headline speaker at the event was Joe Montana. And he said something that, you know, I know he didn't invent, but he said, Somebody asked him, like, what was it like winning four Super Bowls? And he said, for me, it was pretty easy because I believe the way you do one thing is the way you do anything. And so for him, he said, like, every single time I practiced in my mind, I was rehearsing the Super Bowl and I was training and training for the Super Bowl. So when I actually played in the Super Bowl, like I've already been there 10,000 times in my mind. And one of the things that I, I learned from you is is I, I, I know certainly I got stuck there and I think a lot of other people get stuck there is. Purpose for me is like where most people like is they think it's supposed to come in this download and you just have this big realization and all the dots connect. And it does happen like that sometimes. Like I heard of JK Rowling. She was just riding on a train and just got a download for the Harry Potter series and had to take dictation for days and, you know, ultimately wrote this whole series and was a huge success. And there are stories of that, but I would say like 99.9% .9 of the time, Purpose is created and it starts in the really small mundane shit that doesn't really seem like what you have for breakfast, what hours you're going to do this stuff, just 
noticing when your energy is on point, what, who do you want to work with? What do you want that to be about? Like, it's a lot of little decisions that when you add them up to collectively come up to something bigger where you start to realize like I'm, I'm doing stuff with people who I want to do, making a difference how I want to do it. But it doesn't start as like this big download. It was like, it's really just like, okay, you can have anything for breakfast. Like, what do you want? Let's be purposeful about that. Well, I want it to be delicious. I want it to be healthy. I don't want to spend too much money on it. I want it to be quick. And like, what fits that description? Okay, well, this fits that description. Let's be purposeful about breakfast. And what you find is you start to do that in the small things. Suddenly it adds up to something bigger. And and thanks to you, I'm not sitting around waiting for a lightning bolt of like purpose. Like um, I keep, keep a lot of notes when I have a good idea kind of thing, but it's, it's to me, it's about um, all those little things. And, and as far as like having an impact on people, I find that, uh, you know, one of the things you were talking about earlier that I was kind of thinking about was, I think it's on us as like people who have these meaningful messages to figure out how to use the platforms the way they were intended. So like a small example of this is I realized like on YouTube, you know, you mentioned like there's 8,000 trillion videos of girls shaking their asses. If you want to compete with that, like you have to be on that level of entertainment for people. You can't just be like substance, like the world does not crave purely substance. And if you just embrace the fact that that's how it is, then you can do stuff. And so like the other day I created a little video and it was like, hey, here's how we're getting agency clients without phone calls. That's like one of the, the hooks we do. And then right after I showed these two rednecks and right in front of them, they're recording a video and a lightning bolt, like just strikes a tree in front of them, blows it up. And they're like, Wah! and they're going mental. And so in the first five seconds of a video, I'm saying, hey, when you figure out you can get people without phone calls, it's like this and then lightning bolts and two rednecks. But it's entertainment. But I'm also like conveying something meaningful at the same time. But I'm playing the game of, of what. It was designed just to be mindless entertainment. So you got to fit the meaning in with that. And you have, and it puts the onus on us to actually be better at what we're doing to use these tools the way they were intended so that people get the meaning and the purpose, but it's done in the way, you know, if if it's Instagram, for example, it's got to be beautiful, stunning, pull you in kind of entertaining photos, and, but still there can be substance to it. And there's an actual real message delivered. If it's, if it's on YouTube, it's, it can be funny, entertaining videos the way it was designed to do, but still feed like that purposeful thing. And, and so it's it, like you said, I, I'm slowly coming along on that too, is, is not seeing it as, you know, purely as this negative tool, seeing as uh, the way most people use it, but seeing like, if, if you just understand what its intention is, what it's designed to do, and then you feed into that, you can actually spread a whole lot of purpose and meaning using these tools and they become your allies instead of, you know, these things like trying to sell your kids some fucking chocolatey marshmallow sugar thing for 75 cents, right? Like, like it can be used to actually deliver something of meaning. Yeah, life purpose to me was always a concept of you're living it. And if you don't like your life purpose, you've got to make some changes. Yeah. Right, you're living your purpose. Like it doesn't seem that way. You want it to be an externalization. Like you said, like the download, right? Like, oh, that's that's my purpose. But I'm like, no, actually your purpose is tied into your life path. It's tied into what you're actually doing. And you unlock it little by little as you're figuring yourself out. And you do get those download moments, you know. Uh, I think if you participate in sacred plant ceremonies, they have a better chance of getting more of those download moments. It kind of opens up the mind to be. Yeah, able to... I mean, with you, it's like it's 100 times out of 100. There's <laughs> Unless you don't take enough because you chicken out last moment. But for the most part, like. <laughs> don't check it out, man. Don't check it out. Just, just agree that you're going in and we're going to have a great time, right? Yeah. And if we're not, let's purge what's the problem and then let's have a great time. Now, can some, I just say on that front, by the way, yeah. I still remember my first ceremony with you because I had a lot of beliefs and ideas about like who we are and, and what we are. And they were actually kind of accurate in a sense of like, but I had no idea what I was in for. And, and with you, I had my first genuine mystical experience. And I remember like, it just, the eternity of creation just went on and on and on. And I felt like I knew everything. Like I remembered like why my curtains were blue growing up and you know, why we lived on this street and all this stuff. And I just like download and it just went on and on and on. And then at some point after this, like a never ending eternity, I wake up on the jungle floor and I open my eyes and there's you and Christian sitting with headlamps and you guys were drinking coffee, eating your, cornflakes. Like it was the most normal thing in the world. What had happened, right? Like I just had the most significant experience of my entire life. It was like this never ending, like, holy 
shit, whatever I just thought life was. And to you guys, it was just like another day at the office. And you guys were just having the most normal conversation, like, you know, how's how's the the weather over there? Oh, that's cool. And it's, <laughs> And I was like, how do you guys know this? How do you guys, how are there people who know this? I mean, I think that's the beauty of these, of these experiences, right? Like I was going to ask you like some of your favorite, you know, experiences you had, right? And I was just on a podcast right now, just talking about, it. I was like, yeah, last week, you know, 25 people opened up and had direct experience as a source. And <clears throat> these things that are normally considered to be impossible are actually very possible. And not only that, very repeatable. I yeah. think one of the, the crazy things that's happened in my uh, you know journey over the last 20 years is that these things that were first one-offs that were you know spoken about in spiritual circles is like maybe or maybe not would happen in your life over like 20, 30 years. I realized actually come from within us. It's where we're oriented, right? And in the last years, I've become super oriented in like pure medicine, super oriented in source because from source comes all. And that's the source of our creativity. It's the source of our success. It's the source of our love. It's the source of our medicine. It's the source of our families, like ergo source. It's not something that is, you know, somehow put away from us way over there that you can never get. I see people always like looking up and I don't get it because that's not even up, right? It might be down if you're in the Southern hemisphere, it might be only oriented if you think about like North South poles, like whatever, like we're growing out of the earth, right? So, you know, I just think like, you know, it's it's always all around. And ultimately we have this incredible capacity to normalize experience, right? Like we make experience that at first was so mind boggling to us. We actually make it normal. And pretty soon, even direct experience of source, direct experience of the infinite and the eternal, you actually becomes common everyday experiences because we're having them so often. That being said though, I don't think the beauty of it ever goes away though. Right. I mean, there's yeah. something about these peak experiences where the core beauty of them is something that we we can always tap into. Like, t tell me about some of the most beautiful experiences you've had through plant medicines. Well, I'll tell you one. And this this is a quality, quality Hamilton Souther story. And you have some of the best punchlines in existence. Like, you know, in movies, uh, you know, they, they always have a punchline when they kill the guy in the movie or whatever. Like you, you had a pretty awesome punchline. Um, I remember we were drinking at your house. And so this was like kind of private working with like the, the different shamans and stuff you were training. So it's it's a very different experience than the tour where it's this beautiful Hamilton Southers holding a space for you guys to figure it out. On the contrary, you got to you got to work a little harder for it when you're being <laughs> trained for it. a lot harder, I should say, because you got to be able to do this for other people. And uh, I remember you had an employee. I don't I think her name was Carolina. I don't know if she's still there or not, but um she was having some issues with her sleep and not related to plant medicine or anything like that. She just hadn't slept in days. And in, in Iquitos, Peru, it's not like you can just go to the pharmacy and get some sleeping pills. So I remember there was this whole issue. And so I remember we drank. And then at some point, it was the first time I really had like what I would call like a bad trip. Like it wasn't necessarily like dark. It was just really uncomfortable physically and mentally. And, and anybody who's ever drank with you can can confirm that ayahuasca gets very very non-linear very very fast and your sense of time can be extremely distorted even though it may have been an hour according to the clock you, you've now felt like you've been in it for like 40 weeks so i feel like i've been in it for 40 weeks and i remember at some point i hadn't done like a huge dose that day and you said hey hold on a second go help carlina and i'll be right back and so you stopped with the ecros and everything and i started to sober up and i thought oh thank fuck this thing's finally over right like whatever you were trying to show me i got it and i was done about 10 15 minutes later you come back and you 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 hit up an ecro and within two to three seconds i was full-on visionary from sober like I, th I thought this whole thing was over hamilton starts with the ecros and i'm tripping balls again and i was back in this um kind of shitty place and so this happened like three four five times where you left to go help carlina and check on her and then you came back and resumed eat gross and i remember um at some point you were gone and i'm just like you, you had said if you get into any difficulty ask the head medicine spirit of of ayahuasca just ask for help say papa tua help me and i didn't feel like i was getting that help that sometimes like papa tua does <laughs> i always feel like you're getting the pt love in that moment i wasn't feeling the pt love i was feeling uh Mostly like it was, I wasn't being heard. So I just like tried asking different ways. That's what I was doing in my mind. Like, Papa Tua, please help me. I command you, Papa Tua, help me. For the love of God, man, please. And it just went on and on and on. And I couldn't get out of it. And I remember at some point you said, 
if you need help, just come ask. So I went into your bedroom and you were on Skype and you were helping somebody else over Skype. And I came in and I said, Hamilton, um, I see you're helping with somebody. Can you, but when you're finished with that, can you help me? And I started walking away just thinking you're busy, but when you're finished, you'll come get me out of this misery. I've been in it for 40 weeks now. I can handle another two weeks and it, it ain't going anywhere from here. And I remember you, you, you said something like to the effect of you stubborn motherfucker, get back here. And you laid me out on your massage table. Now at this point in my reality, it's been like this, it felt probably like I would say legitimately like 40, 50 hours of just suffering and misery and not feeling good. And I could not get on it. I remember you walked over, over and I don't remember the whole thing, but you were very like, you were loud about it. You put your hands over me and you were like, Christ, straighten the mind, Buddha. Release the story of suffering. And you were like doing these incantations over my physical body. But for me, I remember you, you were like, celestial angels surround this being in divine light. And as you were saying it, it was happening for me. Like, like I felt this Christ being just, my mind just went like straightened in two seconds. I've been trying for 40 hours to get my mind to stop being insane. And then two seconds of Hamilton telling me it worked. And then I remember I would, I felt this like, you know, just booty calm, like my body had gotten jittery and just went and like chilled out. And then I saw all these angels around me and, and I'm like tripping balls, like, holy shit, what's going on here? And I remember thinking in that moment, I was like, holy shit, like you're just on another level. And I remember I asked you, I was like, how the hell did you just do that? And you just laughed at me. And I'll never, this was your, your one liner. You said, well, that's why they call me maestro and you're just a baby. <laughs> that was it. You laughed <laughs> <away>. <laughs> I mean, I've had quite a few of those, but uh, uh, those kind of wild, crazy experiences. But I don't know. That one came to mind right now. That is a good story. Uh, fundamentally, we train, right? We train and train and train and train and train. And then we train and train and train and train and train to the point that what we're talking about and what we're invoking for us is 100% real. And yeah. those aren't concepts and ideas. Those are friends. And they're, yeah. they're partners. They're people that we work with. They're beings that we work with and stuff like that. And so... Yeah. Can I no. just say on that front? Because I actually remember asking you about it after just some of the crazy healings and stuff you've seen. And you said um, some lady said she had a depression and this angel being came down and like a laser of light came through their head and removed this dark mass and said, like, this is your depression. You can let it go. And it's like, when you hear that, like, what do you think? Like, is that not the most amazing thing in the world? And for you, that just like a Tuesday, because you've seen that a hundred <laughs> times a week for 15 years. And so you were just like, well, who do you think? called the angel in the first place <laughs> <laughs> that's funny oh man so for you what is success what when you break it all down what is ultimately success for you you know this i i struggled with that like for a long time like to even define it to myself and i had a mentor who said it to me in the simplest way i've ever found that always stuck with me he said success to me is doing what i want when i want with who i want and a lot of times we think it's a monetary thing, like it's a, when I hit X number of dollars, I'll be able to do that. But there's a lot of people making a lot of money that are not living life on their own terms and, you know, are in various forms of a prisoner to different things. I actually remember I was in a super like uh, L.A. kind of like Ashton Kutcher was there and Jack Canfield, the chicken soup for the gold soul guy was like this. A uh, super fancy like Hollywood charity party. And I met a guy there who had sold an app for $300 million. And I was like, I was super intrigued to hear his story after he told me I just got $300 million a week ago. And uh, when he told me his story, it went into like, well, you know, my family, I lost my family. I became an alcoholic. I'm, I'm basically a one dimensional human being. And I thought like, that's not success when you start to see it. Like, on the surface, 300 million sounds really cool. But if you like destroyed your health and broke up your family and your kids don't know who you are, that's not winning. So I look at it like it's really a lot simpler is is if you are doing the process your way, those outcomes will happen as a result. Like to me, it's like planting seeds and watering it like inevitably it will. Um, but usually when people think success, like the, the first thing people's minds go is to like monies and cars and those kind of things. And I've met lots of miserable people with those things. It's to me, it's much, much simpler. It's doing what you want, when you want, with who you want. If you can do the kinds of things you enjoy doing that actually like create meaning in the world, and you can do them like time-wise on your own terms. And sometimes as, as you can affirm Hamilton, like sometimes that's, I get to work 20 minutes and then go spend the whole day on the beach. But there's also lots of days where like, it's an 18 hour 
like I got to do what's got to be done kind of day. But regardless, if it's done on your own terms where you, where there's nobody saying you got to be here at nine o'clock and you can't leave till then, um, if you're doing that on your own terms and you're doing it with the kind of people that for you are the right people, like that to me is success in the simplest terms. And inevitably the outcomes that people want out of those processes. I learned this, somebody called it the perfect average day. And to me, it's like, if you live your perfect average day, keyword being average, because, you know, like you're not going to every day jump out of a plane into the Playboy Mansion and, you know, go party it up till three in the morning. Like there's going to be very normal days, but if you can nail your perfect average day where on a daily basis, you're doing what you want, then it, it's that to me is success. I'm actually about to turn 40 in like a week. And it's, it's hard for me to figure out what I want to do for my 40th birthday because every day I do what I want to do. So it's, it's you know, what's what's going to be different about 40 trips around the sun than 39 and 364 days? I don't really know. And, and I think that's how you know, like when you really have it, where when you have a chance to have an extra special day and you're like, it's kind of what I already do now. I just I want the simple joys. I just want to go to the beach. I just want to eat some good food. I just want to hang with some cool people. I just want to go make some money. I just want to, you know contribute in this way i just want to share a few thoughts over here make a little video like i'm already doing that and so um that to me is the simplest definition is like if 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 you're if you nail those three things in the process the outcomes will come out of them well, that's awesome i agree i think success is in the eyes of the beholder and you know understanding that it's not just the amount of time that you put into something but what you're ultimately getting out of it is I think key, like you say, some days it's a lot less time and some days it's a lot more time. And if you're really putting your heart and soul into something, it might not even seem like it's that much time because you're so much yeah. in, you're so into it. That being said, Frank, it's unbelievable having you on the podcast. Thank you so much. Tell everybody how they can find you in this incredible digital world we're in. Well, of course, as we mentioned, the old social media platforms, if you guys are seeing this on video, I'm holding up Frankie Finn's book here, Beyond the Agency Box, which you can find on Amazon, especially for those of you guys who have like high ticket service consulting, marketing agency, coaching kind of businesses. It'll be, it's a pretty life-changing book. It took me 15 years to figure out all the, the hard stuff in there. And, and my goal is like you said, is to have people be able to do in 15 days, what took me 15 years to figure out, like it doesn't have to be this long, arduous struggle. A lot of times when you're on the journey, you don't even know what you're doing wrong. So it takes you seven years to figure out what you're doing wrong. And then when you get it, you get it like you never got it. And so I hope that that can be a useful tool or resources. And as well, if you guys want to connect, I'm, I'm probably most active on the old Facebook. So holler at a boy there. All right, Frankie Finn, thank you for being on the Blue Morpho podcast. Again, it's always a pleasure. Can't wait to talk with you soon. Big hug from here. See you guys on the Thanks, other side. Brother.